This has been a difficult week, and I want to say to you that it wasn't until really yesterday afternoon that I felt impressed to change what I was going to be preaching. We were going to be looking at, a, at Titus, and uh, this morning I feel very impressed to help us as a church to be able to to have a biblical perspective on the events of this last week. We have been affected in our hearts. We have been affected in our minds. There's no doubt that some in this room have been affected more than others. There's some of you that, um, that you're largely uh, maybe disconnected from the news a little bit just because of either the busyness of your life or the patterns of your life, you, you haven't really um, watched very much and um, seen very much. Others of you have watched it wall-to-wall coverage and have paid a great deal of attention to it, so we come from a very wide range in this room this morning. But let me tell you that our culture around us is looking. Our cultural, culture around us is deeply affected by these kinds of events. And I think it is right and I think it's wise that we as Christians know how to view these things and that we don't view them through maybe our own uh, segmented, preconditioned ideas, but we want to look at them from a biblical perspective because that is the safest way for us to properly interpret what's going on around us. This week was a difficult week. This week, as we looked at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, just 23 miles north of us, and some of you perhaps were near a computer or near a television at 2.15 p.m. on Wednesday, Valentine's Day, as this began to unfold. I believe it's right that we remember what has happened, and I believe it's right that we consider these issues as we saw images that we should not see, as we saw difficulties and terror only a few miles from us. And we had a wide range of question at first as to what was happening, and then this, the individuals, lives lost, not just lost, but lives taken from us. That was Wednesday. On Thursday, a church that we planted a church that is pastored by Pastor Eddie Bevel and Laura Billingsley Bevel, our former pastor's daughter, hosted this prayer vigil at noon on Thursday where thousands of people gathered at Park Ridge Baptist Church to just begin to try to put handles on what has happened. Stunned and grieved. We came as everybody from local pastors from Church United, uh, uh, a host of, of churches that pulled together the meeting, the governor, people from the school board, coming together to try to begin to process what has happened in our community. The release of 17 balloons that would represent those lives that were lost, not to return. And then, after that vigil, we saw people beginning to gather at Stoneman Douglas High School and over at the community area. And that evening, and the next evening, there was more and more and more as there was an outpouring of grief and disbelief. Thousands upon thousands of people affected. When you have 17 people 
taken three teachers, 14 children, that translates into thousands. And not only that, but the many that were wounded. And of course, the many that narrowly escaped. These events affect us, and our culture doesn't quite know how to, do, to deal with it and what to do. It's appropriate that we as Christians consider the grief and as we as Christians have a perspective as we see our culture real in these difficulties. Because it's not only grief, but there's also rage. And it's not an inappropriate rage. Some of you perhaps saw this mother whose daughter, a 14-year-old, died. And this was 30 minutes after she had finished the funeral arrangement services that she wound up on CNN in her agony and in her anger. And all who watched, whether the broadcasters or whatever, were taken by the rage. We need biblical perspective on this. We need to see what God has for us as we process these things. Let me pray as we begin. Father, I pray that this morning that you would grow us and mature us in you. I pray that these great days of difficulty, Lord, would find their place in our understanding of the world. And Lord, what it means for us to be before you in a fallen world. And I pray that today that you would make clear to us how we should view the agonies and the tragedies of this earthly life in light of your grand plan. So Lord, give us your grace this morning. I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and speak through your word. Most of what we're going to do this morning is read your word. And I pray that you would allow your words to bring us life and understanding. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> yes, this morning is a four-pager, and the reason it is a four-pager is because I want you to read the Scriptures. Friends, Psalm 119, 107, if you have a pen from the pew in front of you, right on, Psalm one, right on, that, on that pen, it says Psalm 119, 107, and it, what does it say on that little pen? Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. You see, God's word brings us life. We live in a world where the, where the consequences of sin are grand and great, and they are painful and hard. But God's Word is what brings life. In fact, Jesus himself was called the Word, and the Word became flesh. The truth came, and the truth came to bring life. And so this morning, much of what we're going to do is read Scripture, and I'm going to make some comments along the way. But in order for us to to, to really look at this and to, to be able to understand how to begin um, in this, I believe it's important that we be honest. For many of us, perhaps not all of us, but for many of us, there's been significant shock. We, we have had emotions, and that's what this number one is that is here. There's a, there's a range of emotions that we've experienced this week which are, which are very human. They're very natural. They're the way that God created our hearts to deal with the life that is around us. We see these emotions in the Psalms. We see them in the life of Jesus and some of them in the life of Jesus. Jesus himself was an emotional being. Our God is a God that has emotion. 
Notice, number one, we have experienced disbelief. We have experienced shock. Many have experienced terror. Great sadness. At certain points along the way, numbness. Rage, despair. Some have a a sense of doom in an event like this. And of course, we think of loss. I I cannot believe the the parents that have been interviewed after losing their child. And I cannot imagine the loss that they feel as some are even burying them today. And then there's this feeling that many have of vulnerable, that we're not safe, that there's a vulnerability in this present world that is here. And statements that could be made are here like this. We might think these things or we may say these things. Oh, God, help. Not again. How many of you felt not again? How can this be? These are lives taken. They're gone. Other lives forever wounded and ruined. Never the same. Where is safe? Am I safe? Is my family safe? Are my children safe? Many different questions. If we're going to be really honest as Christians, it's not inappropriate for us to ask these questions of, and to, to have the freedom to say, where was God? Why didn't he stop this? Is he not in control? Is he in control? If he is, how could he allow this? These are not inappropriate questions to ask that any thinking Christian should begin to develop their understanding based upon his word. You see, number three would be, we are rightly emotional about this. It is not incorrect for us to experience emotion in this. We are rightly prompted to ask questions that's that's not inappropriate. It's appropriate for us to ask questions. But above all else, we need, fill this in, biblical perspective. We don't need cultural perspective. We don't need psychological perspective. We don't need sociological perspective as much as we need biblical perspective on these things. The world around us is filled with deception. The world around us is rife with confusion. We, we live in a world where even Wednesday night, Pastor Lucas was preaching to us and described for us that the God of this world, the present God that's on a leash, Satan himself, seeks to bring about all kinds of confusion and all kinds of, of pain and sorrow and death that results in great, great hardship. You see, anything other than biblical perspective leads us astray. The world doesn't have the answers to these problems. The world doesn't have the explanation to these issues. The world doesn't have the solutions. There there may be many different things to approach after an event like this. There's no question that there will be. There's no question that there will be issues that need to be approached with familial understandings within our society, within the issues of mental health that is there. And there's, there's all kinds of questions and issues that can be brought about when the issues of gun control and all of that kind of thing, all of that can be discussed. But let me tell you that any range of all of those will not fix this kind of problem, as you're going to see. Even the greatest gun control advocates or the greatest the, the greatest ones on the other side of that, that, that's not the focus of this. I want us to see far beyond that this morning. Notice with me, 
Our recent study last year on biblical worldview is absolutely indispensable at a moment like this. If you will allow the truths that we looked at from that time, you say, well, I wasn't here last year. Well, l- let me give you one or two sentences on what we saw. We saw that there is a grand narrative in the Bible. The whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation has this picture with four key words. And before Alex puts them up there, does the congregation want to try on these four key words that progressively moves from Genesis on? Anybody that's got it, say it with me. Number one, there is creation, fall, redemption, and glory. Go ahead and put it up, Alex. Can we say those out loud together? There's the, there's the issue of creation, God makes it. And then what? Fall. We fall into sin. We come into the vortex of saying no to God, of rebellion against God. And then you see redemption. And we've just been singing about it. The grand hope in the grand scheme that ends is finally in glory. And this is with God having all things made new, having all things redeemed from the fall. And so if you're, if you're looking at this this morning, maybe this is the first time you're here this morning, great. Notice creation. This is Genesis 1 and 2. I mean, all of creation exists and, and occurs. And gen- the Bible only gives it two chapters. How much I would love to know how God did all that he did and how much he has, he has done in that. I mean, we look at science, we look at everything else, and we, we, we see the beauty of his creation, the intricate nature of his creation, and it simply says he did it. <laughs> he did it. But then we see in Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man. We see that humanity says no to God. Humanity rebels against this good and gracious creating God. And in that fall, in that fall, we immediately see all of this ripping and this tearing that occurs between God and man and eventually between man and and woman and not only man and woman but all of mankind. We see that it spirals down to having not needed a covering to needed a covering because of shame and because of separation. And the first persons that are born on the earth, Cain and Abel, deal with what? Murder. My friends, from the get-go, from the get-go, our rebellion brings agony. It's important that we remember creation, fall, redemption, and glory when we look at events like this last week. Now, notice here on your outline, Parkland, what has happened in Parkland is real, it's close, it's horrific, yet it's only a taste of a much wider reality. It's only a pinch of a much wider reality. I'm going to give you some numbers, and I, I want you to see some of these numbers. I want, you to, I want you to process this with me a little bit, and I want you to see not the smallness of Parkland, because Parkland is huge to us, but I want you to see the grander problem that should be so very evident to us as we consider the world that we live in, there were 17 deaths at Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland this week. In 2016, and we're using 2016 numbers because the 2017 numbers are not complete yet, so we're still only in February, but in 2016, there were 17,250 homicides in America. And then the nation is enraged right now 
as we should be over the deaths of 17 in Stoneman. But look at this number. In America, 17,000 homicides in one year. 44,950 suicides in 2016. I mean, that's a massive city. 44,000 people, almost 45,000 people taking their own lives. 88,000 alcohol-related deaths in 2016. Did you have any idea it was 88,000? 64,000 drug overdose deaths in 2016. And that number has been skyrocketing. You've heard about the opioid addictions. You've heard about, you've, you've seen it on the streets here in Hollywood. Many of you have friends that either have overdosed or have a family member that has overdosed on some type of drug. How about this reality of tragic death? Since 1973, 60 million unborn children. 60 million unborn children have been taken out of the safety of their mother's womb. Staggering beyond perhaps anything, in the 100-year period of the last century, from 1900 to the year 2000, 125 million people were killed in war. That's World War I, that's World War II, that's every conflict that we didn't pay any attention to around the world, and it's including the conflicts that we have paid attention to, like Korea and Vietnam and numerous others. But look at that. 125 million people killed because of war. Just since 2003, approximately 300,000 people have died in Darfur, Sudan. And, and most of you would not know where that is on the map. And that, that's, I'm not judging you. I'm not, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. But 300,000 people have died there, and many of you wouldn't be exactly which sure if there was just an outline of the countries which one it was. And there's been untold agony from genocide. Since 2002, approximately 190,000 people have died in Iraq and Afghanistan. Many, many, many nationals, even coalition security forces, Iraqi security forces, Afghani security forces. How, many, how, how often have we heard about another bomb in a market? 125 today, and last week it was... 175, and the week before that it was 90, and the week before that it was 215. We get used to hearing these numbers as if they're just numbers and not representing someone's life, somebody's father, somebody's son, somebody's daughter, a mother, because of this fall. And then from just the last two years, 2015 to 2017, 8,000 people have been killed in Yemen. Brutal bombings from the Saudi military and various other conflicts and 10,000 in Ukraine. We have members in our church that escaped from Ukraine. What is the picture of all of this? You see, the thing that I would desire for you to see this morning is the great reality of humanity's rebellion against God and his rejection and and rejection of him. So our rebellion against God and our rejection of him. This is the result of our fall into sin and its consequences. So when we see the wars, think about this, when we see the wars, when we see Parkland, when we see the opioid, uh, the opioid overdose, when we see the, the various things that are all around us, we need to begin to think sin. 
we need to begin to think this is a consequence of sin. This is what happens when humanity, this is what happens when humans say no thanks to God. This is what happens when a, a loving creator puts things in motion and we choose something other than him. And that's, that's what this is. This is the result of our fall into sin and its consequences. What is sin? This is so basic but so important for you to think through. Sin is anything that is not of God. Anything that's not of God. It's anything that's not like God. It's that which is not godly. You, I mean, when you begin to wonder if something's sin, you can just ask yourself, well, is this like God? Is this the way God is or not? And if it's not, then it's, then it's sin. You see, Romans 3.23 makes clear to us, for all have sinned, circle the word sinned, for all have sinned, and then underline the, mark, the next part there, fallen short of the glory of God. The word sin is in the Greek language is hamartia, and it means missing the mark. It means as if you're aiming for a target and you miss the target. And I just want to say to you, what target are we missing? We are missing the target of God in his glory. And so when we miss God's target of God in, in his glory, we are missing the mark, and this is sin. You see, godliness is when we are like God, and ungodliness is when we are not like God. It's so basic, but it's so important. So that's Romans 3.23. I want you to see the first part of Romans 6.23, and that actually should say Romans 6.23 and then a little A next to it, because that's the first part of it, not B. But notice this with me. We not only have all sinned, but the wages of that sin, under the word wage, put payment or consequent. You could even put the word result. The results of that sin is death. And the ultimate consequence of missing God, this is missing the mark of God, is both physical and spiritual death. Some would people say, well, be, you, you die physically because of sin. Oh, yes, but don't you wish that that was all that it was? You see, everyone dies physically. We know that everybody, nobody, nobody says, well, well you, we don't really make it out of this world without dying physically. But, but the real death to be concerned about is the spiritual death that is potential that comes after that from not being right with a holy God. And so as we look at this, we, when, when we look and we try to wrap our brain around what kind of evil could cause Parkland, what kind of things could be going on in the mind and the heart and the issues that are there, and not just once in this country, but 170 times in the last year where there's mass shootings. What is going on with people? What is it that would cause us to be able to be capable of this? As I, as I listened to Al Mohler on Tuesday, or Thursday morning, he, he very clearly and very, very precisely said, we have a hard time even being able to process this because it's so illogical. And friends, that is a great word for it because our God is a glorious, purposeful, logical God. And when we look at sin, we go into that which doesn't make sense. Right out there to the sign, right out there to the side, sin will make you stupid. Sin will make you stupid, and it will make you do stupid things. It'll make you trade, make stupid trades. Sin will deceive you and take you down roads that you don't want to go. Sin will cause pain and difficulty, and it will cost you prices that you don't want to pay. 
you see sin brings death. Not only physical and spiritual death, but it, sin also results in physical and emotional pain. Key word, pain. Sin is painful. It may seem pleasurable at the moment. It may seem enjoyable sometimes. There's some sins that just seem like that. It may seem like it's providing relief. It may seem like in some way, shape, or form that it is, it is allowing there to be an outlet of something, that you're being free or something like that. But let me, let me just tell you that sin always brings pain. The next thing I want you to see here, it also brings sickness. Were it not for sin, we would have no sickness. It brings sorrow. It brings strife. This is disunity, conflict. And it ultimately brings separation. And the greatest separation that it brings, you may want to take a note of this, is separation from God and others. That's what it does. And we see that in the idea of death. So this hurts. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. It's right there on your outline. And if you would, let's read it out loud together. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Let's read. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin... So death spread to all men because all sinned. You see, all we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has been turned to his own way. Now, this is going to get better, and it's going to get better fast, but we, we still, we got to get worse first. You got to see this. Church family, you have to understand this. We ha if we're going to be informed Christians that know how to deal with this in our own minds, in our own hearts, and have a gospel to share, we got to understand the mechanics of how stuff like Parkland happens. We have to think through it. We have to see it. And these passages will show you why this stuff happens. And if you'll listen, if you'll pay attention for the next 10 minutes, you will begin to see that there, that there is a, a grand narrative here that's being played out that, that is not hidden. It's very clear. The Bible makes very clear what has happened. So we, we've sinned. We've missed the mark. We've said no to God. We've run into the wage of the sin. We're paying for that. And then we see that we've all shared in it. And look at Romans chapter 1. Romans deals with the mechanics of this, and in, in the very beginning of this great theological letter, it shows us what happened. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. For the right, and and I've, I've kind of put the subtitle out there that God's justified wrath on ungodliness and unrighteousness. That's what we've said sin is. It's not being like God. So when we go away from God, when we go away from his righteousness, then we step into the storm. And here it is. Here's the storm. It's in verse 18. For the wrath of God, the storm of God, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrightness, unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Verse 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. You see, the creation of the world shows you that God is. Middle of verse 20, in these things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. Would you underline that? Futile in their thinking. That means foolishness. And their foolish hearts, so it's mind in their thinking and in their hearts. So, and in their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22, becoming wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Put out there to the side, idols. 
You see, this is whenever you choose to worship something besides God. And that's what mankind did. We chose to worship the creation instead of the creator. Look at verse 24. Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. So then we become very sensual. We, we, just, begin to, we just begin to process life about ourselves in our sensuality. Verse 25, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, they exchanged it, and worshiped and served the creature rather than what? The creator who is blessed forever. Amen. I mean, the picture is, is that you choose to focus on the world around you. You choose to make it all about the here and now of a fallen world, all about your flesh. And that gives over to all kinds of wickedness that goes against his design and his plan and his righteousness and his motion set in place. Look at verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. Verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be. And they were filled with all manner of what? Unrighteousness. And then look at this list. Evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, underline it, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Wow, that made it in there. Watch out, kids. I mean, that's right over there with haters of God. Verse 31, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Verse 32, though they know God's righteous decree that, are, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Friends, this is the picture of a fallen world that said no to God. And then we run to Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, Paul is writing, and he's writing to some who are in the crowd or Jews that are supposedly the religious people, the, the, the people that are part of God's nation. And look what he says. He says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are what? Under sin. As it is written, and now, notice these, these verses that starts with none is righteous, no, not one, all the way down to verse 18, and then notice the, the notes that I've put underneath that. This is where those come from. Paul is quoting from the Old Testament. I want you to see this. None is righteous, no, not one, verse 11. No one understands, no one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. Not one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. That's like a viper, a poisonous snake. Verse 14, their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed what? Blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. And then look at where it all ends up. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is a fallen world. And where there is no fear of God, there is no restraint of the human heart. When you don't fear God, you can do anything. Now, I believe that we need to look and see the great reality of humanity's love for a sinful world and self. Two things, a sinful world and self instead of God. 
we as humans in our flesh, we love the sinful world instead of God. And we love self. John is writing to the church, and he writes in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the, underline it, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from where? The world. Now look what's happening to the world in verse 17. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God, circle it, abides forever. John 10.10. 10. John 10.10 10 makes clear to us the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. That is the difference between Parkland and the truth of God. This, the, the wicked one that seeks to deceive and pull away all of humanity, which has successfully caused us in our sin, in our desire of the flesh, to fall into sin. He seeks to kill, steal, and destroy at every turn. He is not your friend. He will tell you lies, and he will take your life. But Jesus came that we might have life. Notice in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But understand this, and tell me if this does not describe us in this day and time. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self. Lovers of money. They will be proud, arrogant, abusive. Here it is again, kids. Disobedient to parents. Ungrateful. Unholy. Heartless. Ooh, here's an interesting one, unappeasable. That means you can't ever be satisfied. Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, and lovers of pleasure, here it is, rather than what? Lovers of God. Does it mean that we should never have pleasure? You just better not love pleasure more than you love God. God gives good things to his children. He's given us the ability to have pleasure, to have pleasure in a home, to have pleasure in a family, to have pleasure in, your, in the result of your work, to have pleasure in the relationships that you have, to have pleasure in this creation, the beauty of all that he's made. But listen, if you love pleasure more than you love God, it will result in agony and death. Notice this, and I've just put these down. I want you to see this, and this comes from both of these passages in 1 John and in 2 Timothy. The love of self. You see, this is the love of me. This is the love of my experience. This is the love of my life, my opinion, my rights. It has to do with me, 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 and my, my, my. And all of that takes the individual and the society to a very bad place because this is not of God. The glorious thing about the nature of God is his love, and you may want to make a note to this, God's love is an other-oriented love. His love is always others-oriented. When he came and he died on the cross for our sins, it's because he loves us, and he loves us to the point where he would give up his own life. He did not regard equality with God something to be held on to, Philippians 2, but he emptied himself. He became a man, and he became a slave that he would die on the cross for our sins. The glorious nature of God's sacrificial love. You see, 
fill this in, the individualization that is prominent in modern society is selfish and unlike God. And I'll, I'll just say to you that I believe that there's many things that lend itself to this. Our wealth does this. Um, in, in some cases, even our, our American freedoms can lead to this when we run with them outside of the picture of God's grand picture of love. There can be a distortion of even the idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that can be distorted into an individualism that is not of God that wrecks the country. When we, when we give up the picture of relational humanity being made in the image of God, being made to relate to one another, being made to, to sacrifice and to love unconditionally one another, you see, the further we get from that design and we make it all about us, the pursuit of my life, the pursuit of my liberty, and the pursuit of my happiness, it ends in destruction. The society can't hold together. And all of this is seen, and, and it's interesting that in these last, since 2008 or 2009, we see that social media is proving to just be an amplifier of the fallen sin nature and the self-love of both the individual and the collective humanity. If you just want to see what it looks like, we can, we can often, and now there's some things on social media that are absolutely fine, it's not a problem, but we all know that there is a massive aspect of social media that is becoming increasingly narcissistic and self-serving. The promotion of me. And this is always ungodly. Okay, would you like some good news? Are you ready for some good news? Right, do we need that right now? We need that. We need to know what the good news is. Now, I, I've shared with you before, my professor from seminary, Dr. Gray Allison, said, boys, if you're ever going to share the gospel with someone, you have to be careful to get them lost before you can get them saved. They have to understand their need. And Parkland shows us our need. The statistics that we look at on everything from last year to last century show us through all of humanity, we, we have a need. We have a need for rescue. And there is a need that is met through the great rescuer. You see, the great rescue of God is our only hope for life and joy amidst this fallen world. This is the only way out. It's, it's not more counseling. I mean, that can help in some societal issues. It's not new laws. That they can help with, with certain aspects of society. There's no doubt about that. There's a certain grace that is given through the collective means of a society of, of seeking to govern itself. There's no question that there's balance, uh, that there's benefits from that. But listen, the real need is the spiritual rescue from our sin. And Parkland and all of the events and all of the statistics from the past should show us we need a Savior. That's what should go through our mind. We have to have a Savior. I mean, when you, when you just look at Parkland, there was, no other, there was no other high school in the county that did more drills than, Park, than Park, Parkland. Marjorie Stone, Stoneman Douglas. I mean, I'm not saying that there weren't flaws in their, in their thing, but what I'm saying is, is that it's not like they did nothing. They did a lot. There's no, there's no perfect security plan. There's only a perfect rescue in the ultimate sense, and here it is. We looked at Romans 6.23, the first part of it. Now we want to see the whole verse. You see, we already said, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here is the rescue. And it's the free gift. It's one that cannot be bought. It cannot be earned. It cannot be in some way 
figured out on our own by our own merits. It is the free gift of God. It can only be received. It can only be received. Look at Colossians 1 verse 20. And through him, speaking of Christ, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by what? The blood of his cross. You see, this is a violent rescue. This is not the helicopter comes down and plucks us out of the sea. This is, this is not that. No, this is an exchange. This is one life exchanged for another. We've just sung of it. The in my stead, he took my place, and he rescued my nature, giving me life. And so this is making peace by the blood of his cross. Look at Romans 8, 21. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. What an amazing, beautiful statement that this is where it all goes. And then look with me. Okay, these last two passages are where it gets really sweet. Look at Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. This is John's writing at the end of the Bible. This is, this is the last part of the revelation of all that would be seen. Look at verse 1. John is writing, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Underline new. New. This is new. It's been remade. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. You see, the first heaven and the first earth was corrupted. This is, this is our, our fallen, corrupted, sinful place filled with death and consequence and sorrow. And the sea was no more. In verse 2, and I saw the holy city, new, underline it, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And I love it. Look at verse 4, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated, seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making what? All things new. This is the great rescue that we need. This is the great rescue that Romans chapter 6, verse 23 is talking about. For the wages, the payment of our sin is death. That is, that is spiritual and physical death and all of the sorrow that comes with that. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He doesn't have to rescue anyone, but he rescues all who will believe upon him. Now look at this. I love this, and we're going to close with this. God's promise. In God's promise in Romans chapter 8, we see that these present groanings, from these present groanings to his glory restored. This is what we've been talking about, creation, fall, redemption, glory we go from groaning, and, and what we've seen this week is groaning, but I want you to see where it winds up for those who are, don't put anything away. This is very important. You need to see this. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. For I do not consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory, circle the word glory, that is to be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We've just read that. Look at verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been, underline it, groaning together. That's what we see. That's what sin does. It caused us agony under the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves 
who have been the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, not hope that is, that is seen, excuse me, now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees, verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Verse 26, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what to pray as we ought. And the Spirit intercedes for us for the groanings too deep with words. Verse 27, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints willing according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that we might be the firstborn from many brothers. And those whom we were predestined, he also called. And those he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also, what? Glorified. Do you see where it's all going? We go from being in the state of bondage and corruption and sin to this beautiful path of God's redemption and his glory. And it winds up that he shares his glory with those who are under his blood. And then these are some of the most precious words in the Bible that have been quoted so many, many, many different times. Look what it says. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. He's saying, if God has justified you, no one can accuse you. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who, at the right, who is at the right hand of God. Who indeed is interceding for us. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, verse 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. This is the rescue. Amen? Amen. Friends, we, we have to process the agonies and the groanings and the troubles and listen, the cancer and the car wrecks and the wars and the shootings and the, the abuse. We have to process it in proper perspective. That this is what happens when humanity says no to God. But oh, when God calls a heart to himself and says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. He says, all who call upon me, call upon his salvation, he comes and he brings freedom of the soul from the bondage of corruption and sin and death. And not only from physical corruption and sin and death, but also, much more importantly, spiritual. Church family, when you see the atrocities of this world think sin and then think about the rescue that God so gloriously gives in Jesus. You see, the world needs to know that Christ died for the anguish and the hardship of our present experience. And you know, when God is calling people to, to himself through these events, we just got to be ready to be there and share. So when somebody says to me, can you believe that you're a pastor? How do you process the thing that happened in Parkland? You're a pastor. What, 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 what answer do you have for that? I look at them and I say, it grieves me how 
fallen our world is from God. This shows me we don't have the answers. This shows me there is no safety here. This shows me we need a Savior. This is in bold print that you need a Savior. And there is a Savior that is good to save. And if we will cast our care upon Him, He will care.